Good afternoon, everyone. This is a uh, Prescott City Council study session. Today is Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Good. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Singh. Here. Councilman Montoya. Here. Councilman Moore. Here. Councilman Sishka. Here. And Councilman Tenney. Yes. All are present. Very good. Today we'll have uh, two items for discussion. So we'll start off with item A. Uh, City Clerk, would you uh, read the uh, topic? Discussion and update regarding the reconstruction of the water production facility in Chino Valley, construction of the intermediate pump stations west of the airport, required pursuant to the 2005 decision and order and project funding discussion. Good afternoon. Uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Thank you. Uh, Ashley Couch, Public Works Director. Um, I'm really excited to be able to give this presentation uh, this afternoon on the water production facility and the intermediate pump station. It's a $60 million project, and this is actually the largest project I've ever been associated with in the public sector. So, uh, congratulations. To present this to you today. So, um, so uh, first, there's been some conversations about whether this project is in violation of Proposition 401. So I'm going to start right out of the gate and address that issue. So Proposition 401 was passed in uh, 2009, and it, was a, it basically amended the city charter, uh, Section 16, uh, which requires voter approval on a referendum for certain high-value projects. It's, it's known as the Taxpayer Protection Initiative. It defines a project as a group of related activities undertaken for the purpose of performing a discrete function or set of functions or creating interrelated infrastructure. So um, it did pass in 2009. The water production facility and the intermediate pump station projects are different but interrelated. Um, we consider this as one big project because they're interrelated. So is this one project, the answer to that from our perspective is yes. They're, they all work collaboratively to provide water infrastructure uh, to the city as a whole. Um, in the proposition, there was a CPI adjustment starting in 2011. Um, it started at $40 million. Anything over $40 million required voter approval on a referendum, but there would be a, uh, an inflation factor. Uh, it would be adjusted by the Consumer Price Index annually starting in 2011, and um, if the value uh, that would trigger the threshold today is $51 million if you apply the CPI since uh, from 2011 until the end of 2021, uh, that va threshold value now is 51 million. And since this project is 60 million as a whole, it, it exceeds that threshold. Okay, the water production facility is 19 million and the IPS project is 41 million. So how are we not in violation of Proposition 401? Uh, two ways. Uh, we only need one way, but in two different ways uh, we are exempt from Prop 401 because there were exceptions that were built into the referendum that passed that amended the charter. One of them is replacement or repair of existing water sewer lines. Uh, the water production facility in Chino Valley is exactly that. And so check mark, that's exempt from 401. Okay, and then C, um, projects mandated by state or federal law or a court order. Uh, the 2005 decision in order um, by ADWR um, required that the intermediate pump station be built um, kind of indirectly, but because we have to integrate the airport wells into the city water supply, pursuant to that decision in order, a uh, way that we can do that, um, mixing the water with the water coming in from Chino and delivering to the whole city is through construction of the IPS. So check on that one so we are not in violation um, of Proposition 401. So with that being resolved, I'm going to talk about the projects. Okay, let's talk about the water production facility. It's in Chino Valley. It's the primary source for water production in the city and it pumps water um, to the city's tank at 
Douglas Avenue and Willow Creek Road, and it leaves the production facility at 400 PSI. That is really high for the industry. Um, if there were to be a water line break in that line, we and we have three of them, we have a 36 inch, we've got an 18 inch, and we've got a 12 inch coming in from Chino Valley. And if one of those were to break, you'd probably see the geyser from downtown Prescott. Okay, at 400 PSI, it, it would really be uh, a sight to behold and something we don't want, obviously. Um, but that's right now what it takes because we're at elevation 4,500 in Chino Valley and our highest customer is 60. Councilman Montoya had a question. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, just out of curiosity, what is like a, a standard for PSI in like in municipalities like ours? Um, or is there a standard or is there a level that's kind of, I mean, because when you say it's it's really high, I'm just curious, like what, what would be a... Well, I can say that the project's going to lower it to 200 PSI and that's much more reasonable. Okay. Uh, it's going to lower, electri ele lower electrical costs for pumping. There's There's less friction. Uh, lower electrical costs, um, and obviously uh, it will reduce the frequency and severity of any waterline breaks by pumping at 200 PSI as opposed to 400 PSI. So that's much closer to a standard range. What we deliver to customers is about, our target is 40 to 80 PSI. Oh, wow. Okay, but it's okay to pump it up here at higher pressures. That's not what comes out of your tap. Sure. Okay, we have... Um, uh, Pressure uh, regulating valves, PRVs, that uh, can reduce the pressure to acceptable levels. So what comes out of your tap is reasonable, which is about 40 to 80 PSI. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Good question. Okay. Um, and th basically that tank at Douglas Avenue and Willow Creek Road is zone zero, and that feeds basically the rest of the city. So um, now the... Uh, Water production facility in Chino Valley was constructed in 1947, so it's 75 years old. Obviously, something that old um, needs to be uh, upgraded to current design standards um, and you know, replaced with newer infrastructure that's more efficient. Um, we're building new capacity there, so it's more redundancy in case of a failure, in case we have to take something offline. We've got other ways to deliver water to the city, like we did with the PFAS issue at Airport Wells three and five. Had we not had redundancy, we'd be in, in more uh, difficulty. Um, we were able to shut those down because of that redundancy. So there are five production wells in Chino Valley. Um, and uh, there were updates in, uh, let's see, uh, upgrades at the Chino facility in 1955 and 1978. So we haven't messed with it in quite a long time. So um, one of these tanks is new, and one is being relined. Um, the, um, we're building, you can see in the foreground there, that's the pump house. Okay, you can see the wellheads there. Um, and basically uh, where the water comes in from uh, the different wells that we have in the Chino area, it comes into this area. Um, and then that from here, it goes to the rest of the city. We're building this new pump station here. And the new infrastructure provides uh, more efficiency, um, reduces operational costs, um, provides a higher level of reliability through modernized equipment. Right now, we have to do a lot of maintenance out there because it's old, right? And you replace it with new stuff, you know, it costs less to maintain it. And like I said, combined with the IPS, the pressures will be cut in half, so 200 PSI. So this was brought to city council in December of 2020 and was unanimously supported to go forward with construction of the water production facility in Chino Valley. Uh, where is This is a photo before, uh, this is from 2012, an aerial, and you can see there it's east of SR 89 in Chino and south of Road 1 Northwest of Road 1 East and just south of it is Chino Valley High School. And this is a picture of how it looks now you can see the new tank, you can see the water production facility under construction, and um, this is what it looks like uh, today. Okay, let's talk about the, um, inter I'm gonna switch gears and talk now about the intermediate pump station. Um, let's start by talking about the 2005 decision and order from ADWR. This is a court order, um, and basically, uh, here's what it reads, that Prescott has amended it's CIP to include funding for the construction of two new recovery wells, and those are 
it's, it's really at least two, and we constructed three, um, which is actually better, and that's airport well numbers two, three, and five to be located within the area of hydrologic impact to Prescott's underground storage facility, and they've got a number there. Just so you know, I, I didn't know what that was. That's the airport water recharge facility. So basically, rather than taking the water out of Chino and depleting the aquifer out in the little Chino, we're now taking the water out right where we recharge it, okay, which is uh, better for the little Chino aquifer to not deplete that aquifer. Um, and so by moving it here, we're basically taking it out of the ground where we're putting it into the ground. And we needed to have the capacity to pump it at least 4,000 acre feet per year. And we have more than that with these three wells. Okay. Um, intermediate pump stations um, include two six million gallon storage tanks. And those are necessary to integrate all the city wells into the overall uh, water production system. This is uh, the site when it was graded before the tanks were went vertical. Um, let's talk a little bit about the location of it. Um, you can see there, uh, the, this is the parcel where the intermediate pump station is located. It was originally planned to go right here where the cursor is, and we purchased that land for a little over $600,000. Um, ultimately, it was decided to move it over to this location, which saved the city a million dollars because the transmission lines coming in from Chino Valley you see that scar right there from the, that's, that's where we did the excavation many years ago to build those transmission lane lines coming in from Chino Valley. And this is right there. So it saved us money have, from having to go uh, back and forth. But if we were to put it here and our transmission mains being here, so it saved a million dollars. Again, this is the location, this is the aerial view, uh, a little bit zoomed in. This is Deepwell Ranch. This is the location of the uh, IPS. Um, it is, if I go back a couple of slides, it's cut into the hillside here. You see that? The top of the tanks are about the same elevation as the top. They're 38 feet tall. They're about the top of that hill. So I, I heard some concerns expressed when we made our site visits about, well, are we building a hazard in, in the impact area of the airport? Uh, well, uh, no more than what was out there before because we cut the hill down and built the tank so that it's basically the same elevation as before. So the answer to that would be no, we're not creating a hazard to the airport. Okay, um, again, the cost is $41 million. It works in tandem with, as I said before, they're interrelated projects with a water production facility in Chino Valley to reduce the pumping pressures, creates a new pressure zone and improves system efficiencies by combining pressure zones that exist today. So it augments the pumping of the wells near the airport, which is required pursuant to the 2005 decision and order. It serves and supports the city's entire water system. Um, and then these are two six million gallon uh, concrete tanks that they enhance the city's water supply and provide additional fire protection. Um, several of you have been out there, watch the drone footage. Uh, they're remarkably large, much bigger than, than I, I was kind of, when I came over the hill the first time and saw it, uh, I was like, wow, that's really big. <laughs> I was with Mayor Pro Tem Roosing when she went out there, she had the same reaction. <laughs> they're remarkably large. And They'll serve the city for the next 100 years is the design life. So let's talk about how the water comes into the city today. So it comes in from Chino, these two lines right here. This is the 12 inch coming in. And then right along the big blue line, there's a 36 and 18 that come in from Chino Valley. It goes, like I said, to zone zero. We've got the airport wells out here that serve zone 12. And then those come in. Um, and then the rest of the city is served out of zone zero goes to these tanks near Douglas and Willow Creek, and then from there it goes to the rest of the city. Now what's it gonna look like when we're finished? So the water's gonna come in from Chino Valley like it does today to the intermediate pump station here. Here are the two tanks. Um, water from the airport wells is gonna be integrated. It's gonna come into the IPS, and then from there it's gonna go to the rest of the city. Um, we have about 3% of our customers are in Chino Valley. 
Uh, we have nearly 800 customers in Chino Valley. And then um, we have uh, some customers in uh, S Stringfield Ranch. That's this area, Zone 52, which actually serves these four developments. But Stringfield Ranch itself, only 1% of the water coming out of the IPS goes to Stringfield Ranch. Two, we have right now um, platted 738 homes in Deepwell Ranch. Not all of those are built, but that is basically 2% of the customers in the city. And 3% goes to Chino, like I said before. So 94% goes to the rest of the city. So clearly, the water production facility and the intermediate pump stations are primarily to benefit 94% of the customers in Prescott proper. We've got um, also Chino Valley 3%. And then we have some of these newer developments that are 1% and 2% respectively. Southview. Okay, and then this is just zoomed out a little bit. You can kind of see how it comes in to these tanks at Willow Creek and Douglas, and then from there it goes to all other customers. We have tanks throughout the city. We have, as you're well aware, a lot of topographic change across the city. So we need a lot of tanks, a lot of different pressure zones um, to deliver water reliably to our customers with some redundancy in case of outages. So hopefully we can minimize disruption to our customers. As I said before, it's, it, these have 100 uh, IPS tanks, uh, have a 100 year design life. They're pre-stressed pre concrete tanks. And they'll augment the city's water supply for the next 100 years. So in total, that's 60 million if you include about 600,000 for right of way acquisition. Um, and uh, we have, we contracted this through a construction manager at risk project delivery method. Um, that's basically um, a method, it's called CMAR, and it's where um, you hire a contractor based on qualifications, not low bid, but then you negotiate prices and you actually sign a contract for a guaranteed maximum price. They are not able to exceed that under the contract. So um, that way we're sure we get a quality contractor on the job and we make sure that we negotiate fair market rates for what we pay. Um, Let's talk about funding. So the project is funded half by impact fees and half by water user rates. So we front the money and then over time as new houses are built or new other buildings, they pay impact fees. And that reimburses uh, basically the expenditures that the city made for the water production facility and for the IPS. Um, we have uh, two water infrastructure finance authority loans with low interest 30 year terms. They're very favorable terms. Um, this is a state program. Um, we, right now we have a $25 million loan at 1.59%, obviously very low interest rate. And um, we've already been approved for a $34 million loan. Uh, the interest rate won't be determined until closing. And with that one, as long as we pay everything on time, which we will, uh, we get $1.5 million in loan forgiveness, which is obviously better for our customers. Um, and then um, impact fees can be collected over the 30 year duration of the loans. And with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Councilman Montoya. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ashley, thank you for your presentation. I appreciated all the detail you put into this. Uh, I had two questions about specific things you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned that parcel of land that was initially purchased for $600,000. Does the city still retain that or did we sell it or is there a plan to sell it? I'm going to have to ask Gwen or Tim to answer that question. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I can't tell you which year it occurred in, but we land swapped. We swapped the parcel to the west for the two parcels to the east with uh, Deep Well Ranch. Okay. That, I just want to make sure I understood what happened. There, there was no cost other than the appraisal cost at the time that we did the land swap, so there were no additional monies incurred for the land swap, but that's how it changed. And the appraisal was about $50,000 for that land swap. Thank you. Uh, one of the things, Ashley, that you talked about uh, in your presentation was that upgrading this, this infrastructure will uh, reduce the maintenance costs because 
some of the you know facility, the previous facility and infrastructure was so old. Do you guys have any idea what the cost savings will be? And and if you don't, it's okay. I just you know it'd be something that would be curious to kind of know since we're you know and and probably we're sharing with the public. We can I can look into that. I don't have an answer right now, uh, but we can look into that and see if we can provide an answer. I think it would be an estimate. Yeah, you can't predict the future. Sure, um, but we know what we're paying for an O and M right now, operation and maintenance right now. Uh, and we can presume what we're going to pay in the future and compare those two and, and hopefully get you a ballpark estimate. Of it cost savings. just would be interesting to me to know. I mean, I think it's one of those things where whenever we're saving taxpayers money, it's, it's worth calling out how much we're doing and, and letting them know that we're putting their money to work. Absolutely. Uh, I, I have a question for Joe. Uh, about the first part of the presentation. Joe, uh, I imagine legal was involved in part of this presentation that dealt with the section 16 of the charter concerns. Do you have, can you expand on any of what Ashley said about that or um, is there yeah. rationale that might be worth hearing from the legal department? I, I can address it. I essentially, there's a lot of legal questions, but when it comes down to it, we kind of all agree that this is over the threshold amount and that this is one project, even though there's different portions. So I think we agree on that. And so the question becomes whether one of the exceptions apply. And as you stated in the language itself, that there was these exceptions put in in order to ensure the health and safety of residents. And so I, I know that, and we discussed this presentation, and so I was okay with it going up. But the opinion originally came from my office before I got there, but I've reviewed the opinion and I agree with it that the project does relate to sewer, or uh, excuse me, not sewer lines, but water lines. And, and there has to be a little bit of a interpretation of what that means. And so uh, what we've decided, or what we believe, is that water lines include any necessary, reasonably related infrastructure to use those water lines. Um, and so exception A then applies. And then exception C being that there is a state or federal court order uh, or law that would apply. And so we do have that uh, court order. Um, and, and we're mandated by the court order. We agreed to it, obviously. Um, but we're mandated to provide these exact uh, improvements. And so I think both exceptions apply. As you look back, and I kind of look back quite a bit to some of the original language that was used by proponents of the bill. And uh, an attorney from Gus Rosenfeld was brought in, and he kind of opined about how you try and look at these things. Because I'll just read what he said. I thought it was interesting. He said, these sort of things are involve ambiguities, frankly, in the proposition. And that he has written legislation, so he's not trying to cast stones, but it's not easy. And there's a lot of ambiguities as the way it's written. Um, but as he mentioned in 2011, and I agree with, we have to try and give credit to what the voters who created the proposition wanted. And if we didn't apply, for example, this court order, we would be in violation of the court order. And we have to assume that the voters, just like the courts assume legislatures, try and act in ways that aren't unconstitutional. Uh, and so assuming they didn't want to put us in a situation where we were going to act unconstitutional and assuming they weren't going, voters didn't want us to be in violation of a court order and not able to provide water, the interpretation is that yes, that exception applies. And so I agree with that. Thank you, Joe. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm glad we're having this conversation. I think we should have had it a, a long time ago in the interest of uh, transparency and public uh, input, but uh, some of my concerns are the the um, taxpayer protection initiative, which was passed in 2009 by the voters, and it was initiated by the voters. Um, it was because they wanted to have a voice on major projects, uh, especially like this, that their city undertakes, and it was also motivated by the um, future Big Chino pipeline project. And also the Arizona Constitution guarantees that uh, the taxpayers have a right to vote on big public debt such as this. And this loan, I'm talking about the two WIFA loans, are the largest uh, public work infrastructure loans that we've had in the, um, in the history of Prescott. So we have a total of uh, 55 million in, uh, in loans, which clearly are more 
than the 40 million plus the CPI of uh, 51 million. And, you know, I'm just wondering if we're sidestepping um, that charter because, first of all, the tanks are 12 million, and that, those are new infrastructure projects. The in intermediate pump station, which is going to go immediately adjacent to those two tanks, is 14 million. Um, there was already uh, Mike Fan did a site prep. That beautiful uh, prep was 11 and a half million, and that I believe uh, has already been paid for. So, you know, why are we taking out such a huge loan for for this project? Because the projects up in Chino have already been uh, paid for. So that's that's there seems to be a discrepancy of why we're taking out. And also during the tour, which was um, very, very interesting, uh, Public Works did state that we are upsizing, you know, all this infrastructure that we're putting in, in anticipation of uh, providing water from the uh, Big Chino. And I certainly support infrastructure. Uh, this project is gonna be the, the backbone of our water infrastructure here for the city for many years. And we need to have redundancy. As you know, we have two wells that are shut down now and we still are supplying water. But my question is, if we're taking out a, a, a big debt of 59 million, shouldn't the voters as directed by the charter um, have a say in that? That's, that's my main question. And again, I, I guess I've deferred to Joe on that. Yeah, I think that, I think it is a legal question. I, I think there's a lot of questions kind of related that may not be legal, but as to the basic legal question, I do believe that the exceptions apply. And I think, I think the voters or the drafters of the proposition knew that certain projects like this needed to go through for the safety of the of the citizens and that's why they included the exceptions so i do think the exceptions apply and you know if i might add just like technically how it works we have water coming in from the airport and maybe i can maybe i can show that i can show that map let me go to the map okay so after the project is complete, we, the decision and order required that we drill wells in the airport area and the area of our recharge, water recharge facility, which is here. Um, we did that. We need to integrate those, not just into zone 12, but in the entire city. So that water goes over in the future, once these are built to the IPS and from there to the rest of the city. Um, from a technical standpoint, from my perspective, the IPS is needed because we have to integrate water from the airport wells, which is, we drilled those wells pursuant to the 2005 decision order because that's where our recharge facility is to avoid depleting the little Chino. That's why ADWR wanted us to drill these wells here. Take the water out where we're putting it in. Makes sense for safe yield purposes. And then that water goes to from there to these tanks and then to the entire city. So from a technical standpoint, from my perspective, uh, the IPS is needed in order to integrate the airport wells into the overall city water system. So you have a legal opinion and you have a technical opinion that indeed this is necessary but pursuant to the 2005 decision in order. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. But this is before you, you got here, um, Ashley, uh, when I was on uh, council last year, um, when Mr. Dossett, Craig Dossett was here, and um, we were having a discussion about this project. And in the packet, it said it was gonna be all for Deepwell Ranch. And then he um, corrected that misconception, I guess, and said it was gonna be half for Deepwell, half for, um, the uh, traditional part of Prescott, because you got to remember, Deepwell Ranch is projected to be, have a build out of 10,500 homes, and 
so I find it hard to believe that, you know, just respectfully that it's going to be just a very minor uh, use, user of this, which is okay. I mean, it's it's been annexed, it's approved, and we've got to supply water to it. But just in the for uh, clarity, you know, we're we're kind of I think getting um, different stories. But just in summary, I think we need to follow the. Um, the charter and I was just asking these questions respectfully and I was just doing the job that I was elected to do so thank absolutely. you absolutely and and I just might add this is believe it or not the 19th time we've brought something related to the water production facility and the IPS intermediate pump station to City Council the previous 18 times everything was approved by unanimous vote of the City Council starting with the land acquisition in 2010 Mm -hmm. And uh, ending with GMP number six, which was approved, I want to say, about two months ago. So it, over a 12-year period, it has had the unanimous support of city council on 18 occasions. But um, I understand uh, we're all entitled to mm -hmm. uh, our own opinion about yeah. whether this complies with Prop 401. Yeah, but it still, I still have a question. Maybe um, our budget director could answer this. If we're taking out a loan for $59 million and the project is $26 million for the tanks and the intermediate pub station, uh, is there, what else is included? Is it past work or future work or why, why the big discrepancy? Um, well, let's see if we can find the slide here. I'm getting close, patient. Doo -doo. So the total project is these two together, which is $59 million. So it close included to 60. The, the Chino work, the big, I mean, Chino Valley. Uh, no, it's all for the work that's out at the intermediate pump station water production facility, not the Chino Valley. I think there's some at the Chino Valley, but it's primarily out at the site near uh, the airport. And, uh, and again, the first loan was taken out in 20, 2020. Um, and then the second loan has been approved uh, by council for us to apply for and by the WIFA board to give it to us. We're just waiting on documents from the EPA to, cl to close it, so it may never close. Um, <laughs> but uh, w uh, hopefully it will, and at that point we'll have a locked interest rate. Um, the uh, if the interest if we lock today I keep going the wrong way here if we lock today the um, interest rate would be about 2.5 because frankly the 30 year end of the curve hasn't moved a lot um, that will probably change in the next year but um, and again I'm not sure when we'll be able to close it's we're waiting on with uh, who's waiting on EPA the um, I, I'm sorry I can't read that any new glasses. Um, but the very last slide I've got has the information on there about the, the WIFA loans. Yeah, and again, the 1.5 they gave us was related to the new programs that they're getting from the EPA. The first loan didn't have any loan forgiveness, but we have received a lot of loan forgiveness over the last 20 years that we've been using WIFA. I think this probably brings our total to almost 10 million in loan forgiveness that we've received over that time uh, through three or four, maybe five loans. Councilman Tenney. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So in the previous 19 times, this issue has in one form or another transparently come before the council in public meetings. There's been some reasonable questions asked about, is this all going to Springfield Ranch or other hot button issues? Like, is it all going to Deepwell Ranch or, Things like that, does it violate Proposition 401? When I wonder about things like that, I go to experts, and today we've, we've gone to experts. We've got a technical opinion, legal expert opinion that says, no, 401 doesn't apply to this. No, only a small portion goes to the new developments that people are concerned about. As far as I'm concerned, end of story. I really appreciate you coming to us for a 19th time, and our questions have been answered at this point. I mean, even if we were to um, consider this a uh, an election-related um, approval process, you can imagine how uh, many months it would take to uh, craft a uh, election proposition to get it on the ballot, have it approved, and then uh, have to come back and then uh, try to design this. 
especially in a rapidly escalating inflationary environment, uh, this could end up costing us uh, 15, 20 percent more. And I think uh, even with the 30-year uh, interest rates uh, being pretty flat at the moment, chances are even those would be going up. So when you consider the fact that this is um, qualifies an ex as an exception to the conditions um, listed in the 401 uh, part of the city charter, I think it would be um, uh, probably working against the best interest of the community should that be uh, delayed and put into an election um, cycle. Otherwise, we'd have to create a, a special election, which I think would cost us somewhere around, what, $75,000? $80,000 in and of itself. So I think we have to consider all those potentialities when we uh, look at um, 401 and how it would apply. Councilman Moore. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate Councilman Tenney's uh, observations, and, and I do think it's important that when legislation is craft uh, and when exceptions are put into legislation that is passed into the charter, that those exceptions were approved by the voters. The voters recognize that there will be occasions when there need to be exceptions, and that was part of what they approved when they voted 401 into law. Um, as a business owner, I went through that in 2020 with COVID. And the, the governor said, you know, if you're a non-essential business, you have to close. Well, we looked for exceptions. And like Wilson's Grain, we have a commercial feed license because we manufacture seed. And that was an exception. It was a legal way to keep our doors open during a time when the, the governor said, you have to close your business. We also had another legal exception, which was we sold optics. And because of firearms and uh, police and military, we had rifle scopes and you know optical equipment that allowed us to stay open. So exceptions are common, and they're legal, and it makes it so that we can continue to operate business or we can, can do the city's business in this example. Common, legal, and intended. Councilman Shishka. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I can, I can see uh, Mayor Pertem's argument, but I can also see Councilman Tenney and Councilman Moore's not rebuttal, but certainly answer to that. <clears throat> you know, I, I think that we all have to look at reality here. When, when they crafted 401, and I knew one of the guys who was big in crafting 401, they had to broaden it not to seem discriminatory and not to say, you know, say that they were trying to prevent a one-off. But what they were trying to do was to prevent the public from not voting on the Big Chino pipeline. That was the main reason for Prop 401. So this kind of a situation where it is for the betterment of Prescott and for the whole of Prescott, 98% of Prescott, that would be, you know, using it back then. I think that, that they weren't intending this situation to hold back something like this. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or concerns? Fine, thank you, uh, Mr. Couch, and uh, appreciate your presentation. We'll move on to the next item. Presentation and discussion regarding a proposal to convert select two-hour parking stalls in the downtown business district to open parking. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Just give me a minute to get this down and hopefully get another one up. You know, I think I'd like to lead this off with a little bit of background. Sure. Uh, when we had the uh, parklet situation uh, during the winter and during all the uh, shutdowns of, uh, of different businesses, and I was approached by a number of the uh, businesses on uh, North Cortez saying that uh, some of their parking for their customers was being uh, taken away and it was really impacting their business and they were trying to fight against the parklets and get these um, parking spaces restored. And I think in the past, we also heard from um, um, businesses around the courthouse plaza that uh, many times there were either customers that wanted to shop throughout the uh, 
uh, Courthouse Plaza area, but because they were restricted to two hours, uh, maybe they did a little bit of shopping and then had to go back to their parking space and leave. Um, or try to find another spot, and sometimes it reduced the amount of shopping they were able to do. And then I heard from um, also some of the businesses saying there are certain uh, businesses in the area that their employees are taking those two-hour spots and doing the two-hour shuffle, which means they come out and, uh, and move their car a little bit, uh, make sure they don't get a ticket, uh, but they're taking uh, those customer spaces over the course of a day. So uh, clearly we had some competing interests. And there was always the claim that, well, maybe the employees could stay over in the uh, parking garage and then find a way to either walk or maybe have a shuttle back to where they work. And that's uh, all well and good, but during the winter time when it's extremely cold, that's very difficult for some of those employees to do. Uh, same time when it's raining. And quite frankly, they uh, found ways to not have to do that. Uh, there was also some uh, suggestion that maybe we put in uh, parking meters. I know that was considered years ago. And uh, I know up in Jerome, they have like a main parking kiosk that they use for that as well. Um, whether that is a solution to this, uh, there were still competing interests. So as I started uh, thinking about how many two-hour spots do we have throughout the uh, area? If we could find some two-hour spots that were in maybe one block of walking to the downtown courthouse area and, and the uh, businesses there, I'm sure that the employees would be willing to walk a block. And if they were, we could free up those uh, employee-taken two-hour spots, then we would have more two-hour spots for customers to actually use. So that would help our businesses, it would really help the employees, and I think it would be a very uh, reasonable and modest solution to this, and it was very much well worth pursuing. So at that point, um, I contacted Ian, and we started looking at this overall map, and I think we've um, been able to identify some uh, really reasonable solutions here. So with that uh, premise, Ian, uh, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that, because that really does give the background that I wouldn't be able to give, um, kind of how we started the whole process and then, you know, why we're here today. So obviously, um, listening to the mayor, you know, there's been multiple meetings between staff and him, and then there's been um, some public outreach things that we'll go over as well, and we're still in those processes. but. Um, the presentation today is just to bring it to you guys so that you can see what is being proposed at this point. Um, nothing is finalized here, but um, just as procedural, sign changes, changes to parking, things like that, um, they don't require council approval specifically. Um, the charter allows freedom for staff to kind of modify those things, but obviously this is a sensitive issue. Um, it has implications, uh, good and bad, and so we just wanted to make sure that council's input was heard. Um, but we will be able to move forward after this meeting, uh, just at a staff level, um, when we do some additional public input and we summarize all that, we think we could move forward assuming um, everybody kind of likes it as they see it today. So with that, um, we, we kind of, obviously, you heard from the mayor kind of the goal of the, of the process, and, but, but I'll restate it, that the objective of the process has been, in general, to increase the number of unrestricted, long-term, open parking stalls in the downtown area to better serve employees, residents, and, you know, whoever needs to use those. And, of course, we need to balance that with the needs of all the users and specifically um, to ensure that frequent turnover spaces, which are valuable to businesses, to, to restaurants, are um, retained, especially where they need to be retained. So as a background, currently 70% of the parking spaces in the downtown, and today we'll define the downtown, you know, we have, a, we have a defined area of the downtown central business district, but we're gonna basically look at three blocks from the courthouse. So the first block would be surrounding the courthouse, and then as you go out, and that's two blocks and then three blocks. So we'll mainly stick with the three block 
area around the courthouse as uh, our general what we're talking about. So 70% of those are approximately, 70% is to our zones. And then um, that represents approximately 800 of the 1,200 spaces. So we use 1,200, but that's mark stalls within the three blocks. As you go out further and further, we start to not have, we have areas where they're not marked. So we do have additional stalls beyond that. But for today's intent and purpose, we're um, talking about marked stalls. And so this is just some, basically goes over what we are talking about and what we have. So there's our 1,200, about 787, about 800 are two hour restricted. Within that, there are 30 or 11 30 minute restricted spaces. Those are typically specialized for uh, a particular purpose for a business, for instance. Um, the first block around the square has all two hour parking. There's not any open parking around the first block of the courthouse. Um, within the second block, we have 62% of that block is two hour. And you can see that on the chart there, it's uh, 485 of the 781. And then in the third block, we reduce that down to about 47% of the block. And obviously those numbers are drastically going down because the numbers out there are, uh, most of the stalls are open. There's a lot more open stalls in those areas. So working collectively, going through the process with the mayor, considering location, adjacent property uses, and utilization, that was very important. It, you know, we, I think most of us will identify when we look at the maps that you just know by being someone who lives in Prescott and someone who drives the area, you know which locations aren't being utilized. There were some of those very easy locations to identify. And so by changing those up, um, we, we've been using the term, uh, what is that, the, 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 the fruit that's right there, the, uh, low -hanging. the low hanging fruit, that's the term. <laughs> so we, we really looked at it in that way. How do we identify spots that won't negatively impact frequent turnover uses, but also are spread around the downtown area and are not being utilized and otherwise needed that we can easily convert? Um, so we're going to kind of we're going to get to the map in about two slides, but I'm just going to go through the process. So we identified those locations, kind of went through that at a staff level with the mayor. Um, we felt good about that proposal. He reached out to uh, PDP, the Prescott Downtown Partnership, and the Chamber of Commerce, and set up a public meeting that was held on in early June, June 8th. We had that here in council chambers, and we had a good turnout. Um, quite a bit of. Uh, I mean, probably half full, I mean, pretty good. So we got a lot of input from them and the concept, the initial concept with the maps, we showed them those and it was a good support overall for the locations. And we also asked them to provide input, either negative or positive towards the locations. They didn't have any, none of the spots were removed and we had 114 spots initially identified out of the 1200. And, uh, but they did identify at that meeting 17 additional stalls that we had not thought of based on their knowledge of the area. Maybe uh, one example is the Haciampa Hotel. We had um, proposed some modifications along Marina Street, but they also front on Gurley Street, and that's primarily their users. And they uh, came forward with a request to add eight more on Gurley. Then we saw some additional locations identified on Willis and Granite Street. And so by the time we were done with that meeting, we had 131 identified. Um, at that meeting, it is uh, good to note that, you know, we were talking about parking, we're talking about two hours, and we all know that the issues the mayor brought up about employee rotation, convenience of users, um, it's hard to balance those with open stalls, but it, it's also hard to know whether two hour is the most effective parking restriction time overall. Um, so. There was some discussion regarding whether two hours should be reviewed to three hour. Um, we just bring it up because it's a good input from the business community and it's a larger issue. So today we're just looking to, you know, move forward with the things that we can accomplish easily and, and make a good change quickly. But we do feel that some of those discussions might be coming forward to you if that's the desire of the council in the future. One other thing they mentioned was um, utilization of the four lanes on Cortez. And um, so Cortez by Antique Row has four lanes of traffic. They mentioned um, possible 
conversion of that to help with some of the truck loading and some things like that. So we did get additional input regarding traffic, parking, and other issues. And so we, we see those maybe as future things that we might approach you with or you'll otherwise bring that to us. Um, so we did that meeting, we got their input, but obviously in order to make sure that we talk to everyone, we identified the locations around the stall conversions and we identified 22 additional properties that would need, we, we felt, staff felt, should be contacted so that they could be notified of what we're planning and make sure there's no negative consequences or things we didn't think of. And so we've um, done some mailing outreach. We're waiting, right now we're currently in that period. We're waiting for feedback from them, either in snail mail or by email, and they can contact us as well uh, by phone. But we are waiting until Friday, August 19th to summarize all the feedback that we get in that. And so um, that's just to go above and beyond what we heard from the business community because some people do live in the downtown area. Some of the stalls that we're converting are close enough to residences that we felt like we should at least get their input, um, make sure every business there, they might not have been represented at the June meeting, just so we don't miss anything. And so um, as we get those comments, we plan to summarize them summarize the outreach and basically provide that back to council for, for as information so that you know that there was full support. We didn't have any major changes or modifications. We also feel that we could make slight modifications if they come back with input that says, hey, I absolutely use those two hour parking stalls because I run this business and I need quick turnaround. So, but we can do those minor changes, you know, at a staff level. So hopefully my map will come up and we can go over. There we go, should come up. So I'll zoom in and we'll go to the courthouse. Sorry, I don't wanna make anybody sick. <clears throat> so we'll go. So here, so we're centered on the courthouse. It's not too important to see, but I mean, we talked about the fact that all of the first block is to our parking. So that kind of, that's represented on this map. You can kind of see areas where if we have complete blocks of two hour, you'll see that. The areas where it's highlighted in, um, I have highlighted things in red, and then there's a note that leads to it, are the locations that we ident identified first and then added to. So the ones in yellow are the ones that staff originally identified of the 114 and then after the first meeting we added the orange areas and so the totals on this map add up to 131 so this is union street for instance and we can go through each one but i can also uh, just kind of discuss this so this is uh, first baptist church property there's an area most of us are familiar with all these locations there's an area here where it's all two hour close proximity to the courthouse um, not heavy use during the week, certainly, for a church. You know, that's the kind of place that we identified, made, made good sense. We obviously have reached out to the church to make sure they don't have other uh, needs. Um, but that's a location that was uh, initially identified. As we come up, we had some spaces on Gurley that were holdovers from past uses in the restaurant. This is the old APS pay station by the Hacienda. And this area used to have a lot of quick in and out traffic because you used to, it used to be a bill pay center. Mm -hmm. And so there were two hour, a lot of two hour, 10 stalls of two hour there that are no longer needed and certainly could support the hotel in their needs. Um, and just people who work down here, you know, that is within the one block distance, like the mayor said. We kind of looked in all locations. So as we spiral around, you'll see that they're spread out pretty good. Um, these are just some random ones that were found. Uh, this is near the uh, Prescott Center for the Arts. And they are sensitive to um, restrictions and whether to keep them or not. They currently are under construction for the second phase of their, I think, another theater. So we've been working on them here to determine what type of parking restriction they want to keep. And so we're getting their input on these, but we, we identified those. We identified uh, some north as you go up towards Sheldon on Marina. Uh, most people will identify this area. This is the Wells Fargo 
on Cortez Street north of Willis. That area is underutilized. This aerial shows a lot of use, but if you go out there today, if you were to go here from the meeting and go there, this whole side is not very heavily used. This side is, so we'll retain two hour, but these could be um, opened up. We also have uh, this area by the parking lot just below the Raven. And then we did not expand that over to the, this is the um, motorcycle shop on the corner, but we felt like all of these stalls could likely be open. Now we're waiting for input, of course, on those specifically. Another area where there's a lot of conversion going on, I think in total, what's that, 24, 29 stalls, Granite Street by Chase Bank in the office, heavily underutilized area. Uh, most of the businesses in the area have private lots. Even the title company where we're, there's a, I think there's a title company, maybe a law firm in here, but they have private parking that can be used um, for quick turnaround trips. So that area yielded quite a bit of uh, conversion locations. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a really good one. And that's pretty close to downtown, not very far. You're just right off the square. And you come down, there's, we did not uh, talk about Granite Street. It's limited parking, not too much. So there's no proposal there. But Goodwin Street, the old school district building, that entire block, I think this is uh, Elgato Azul. There's uh, eight, 16, 18 stalls there that are all two hour that are not being utilized. And if you worked on Whiskey Row, that's a quick walk, yeah. just convenient. And then coming around, we just found some random ones. We also had random ones that were just floating out there that we kind of hadn't looked at for a while. We, this is Carlton going into Mile High School and there's some two hours down there. There's no reason that those need to be there. Yeah. So we looked at converting those. And then we had some conversions here by City Hall. We're here in this building. You know, we had converted the ones that are right outside the wall here are converted to open, um, but we still have retained a two hour, which could be used, uh, better utilized. So that's, I mean, that is the, that's the 131. There's actually 131 stalls there that we found. And um, for the most part, 100% of the comments have not been negative towards any of these stalls to this point. Now. Let's go to a couple of questions, Councilman yeah, anytime. Montoya. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ian, I want to commend you and city staff. It looks from this presentation that you put a lot of effort into this, and uh, that's really important to me. But beyond that, I think what you should be commended for, if it, it sounds like you've really reached out to stakeholders and, and made sure that you're connecting with them and making sure that there aren't unforeseen consequences. So I think that's a, a really good thing. Um, and I would just encourage you guys to continue to do that and have that dialogue and you know make sure that this isn't, we're not, ruining someone's business un un unintentionally. Uh, the question I had for you, though, uh, you talked about this briefly at the beginning of your presentation. Um, you mentioned the idea of converting from two hour to three hour, and I was just curious, was there a consensus among the, the stakeholders that you had brought in around that, or does staff have a strong opinion about that, or, or where we stand with this, this three hour idea? So I um, would say that there was no consensus regarding that at the meeting. I think they, uh, they identify as a group that there's a challenge in balancing um, having quick turnover parking, but making it long enough so that their customers can come and actually enjoy a day at Prescott without worrying about running to the car and rotating. There's also the, the challenge that if you don't have enough close by parking for employees and they're willing to do it, they're gonna shuffle. They're gonna do that parking shuffle and three hours you have the negative of when you go to three hour, they can shuffle three times instead of four. Yeah, right. So there was <laughs> the no clear hour consensus, of the two hour consensus about what should be done. They just offered it up as they've an example of things they've seen in other places. And I personally have seen that too. Some places do two hour, some places do three hour. You, you, three hour is, you know, it's used. Um, I'm not clear. I mean, I don't think that staff could stand here today and say, yeah, that's going to solve our problem or that's a better solution. But certainly, I think it is worth looking into and seeing what what the negative consequences would be in positive. But but uh, Ashley has opinions as oh, well. Go ahead. Sure, Ashley Couch, Public Works Director. It, it, it did seem like we heard from the people that came to the Prescott Downtown Partnership and Chamber of Commerce meeting, and it, which was very well attended, as Ian said. But 
Uh, I heard a number of comments in support of three hours. People said, you know, people come, you know, tourists, they come here, a lot of them come from the valley, you know, they want to have a beer, they want to uh, go to a restaurant and eat dinner, and they want to do a little browsing, a little shopping, and that's hard to do in two hours. Sure. And uh, so they, the, a lot of people said that right adjacent to the courthouse square itself, so that very inside loop where Ian is pointing the cursor right now, I heard a number of people say that suggest that we change that two-hour parking to three-hour <coughs> parking. Um, I, I think that has some merit. I think it's worth considering now. Um, like Ian said, you know, I, I think we should do this in phases. The low-hanging fruit is the elimination mm -hmm. of two-hour parking. Everybody that spoke up about that supported it. So, I mean, how often do you have unanimous support for something the city does? Like, never? <laughs> so, obviously, it's like a great idea. So let's do that. And then we'll reach out again to the stakeholders in the downtown area, and let's have a longer conversation about three-hour parking, you know, maybe leaving at two hour, except for right around the courthouse itself, where that might be converted to three hour for those that really, you know, come up and they're tourists and they want to do a variety of things without having to, oh, you know, it's hour and 50 minutes, I got to go move my car. I think from a safety standpoint, um, those folks that want to stay here, let's say three hours, right? Um, and now, their two hours is up. They got to back out into traffic, go find another parking spot, and park for another you know hour or two, right? Um, by providing three hour, that's one less un potentially unsafe movement backing out into traffic. Um, if we were to convert that mm -hmm. inside loop on Courthouse Square to three hours, so I, th I think it has some merit. But that wasn't the focus of the meeting. The focus of the meeting was elimination of two hour parking, and so we I think we've got a broadly supported plan. We'll go back and meet with them about the three-hour issue. I think that's also fairly easy to solve. Let's see if we get consensus of broad support for that concept and where we should put it, and and that we can we can do that right after this. And yeah, yeah, I so think uh, you're on the right track there. We're, what we're trying to do primarily is to get employees to uh, find a long-term spot, park there, get used to making that short walk and then freeing up these other uh, spaces. If we can achieve that, then we can possibly consider that three hour uh, for the, let's say, a little bit longer term tourists to be able to spend a little more time without having to run back to their uh, parking space. Mont Councilman Montoya, you have anything uh, else? I, d the other question I was just going to ask real quickly, Ian, is um, did, in, in your calculations for this, I know, uh, I know when founding fathers purchased the McCormick building from the city, part of their proposal, at least initially, was that they would build out some parking there and that there would be some parking that would be maybe publicly available. Have you, have you factored that into your considerations around any of this? Just like uh, private parking uh, availability, things like that? Yeah, or I guess, I mean, you know, as, as things happen, as, you know, as, you know, I guess parking structures, you know, being available, uh, if, if that's going to be another release point or relief point well you know i i believe the land development code uh, exempts development in the central core of the downtown area from providing parking for the most part i'm not a planner and i'm not going to speak specifically to that but for the most part you know these we're not going to get a lot more parking in the downtown area apart from like another garage or things like that so we do have to manage the on-street parking because that's really our inventory of it. I mean, we do have, you know, there's 500 stalls over in the garage. Um, so that, and that's good, but that's not part of account. We also have Bashford Court. We have other, there are other locations where people are parking and utilizing, but um, we're always going to have a need to manage that on-street parking in a good way because for the most part, we're not going to have redevelopment that's going to put in a lot of parking. There's just no way to do it. And so that's, what, that's, that's the answer to that. Councilman Tenney. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I just want to echo what Councilman Montoya said about the, the partnership here between Mayor coming up with a great idea based on con some constituent feedback and, and then you going right to work and coming up with some really good ways to execute that. That's that's fantastic. Real quick question. It seems intuitive to me, but, but sometimes what my brain thinks and what reality is are, are two different things. Um, I see Chief Barney here. 
can you really briefly just give it the, the thumbs up or a head shake no or whatever? Does this make your life in terms of parking uh, enforcement a little bit easier? Thumbs up, a head shake. <laughs> Whatever you want. If, it, if it's a no, say you're wrong again, so, Clark. And no, we, we enforce traffic at the direction of, of your priorities. Um, we work really closely with Ian and, and his team, so it doesn't um, hurt or help either way. Um, probably, if I had to lean one way, it would probably help us. Um, we do get a frequent amount of, of traffic complaints about parking, um, and I think if we can mitigate some of that by extending the times, it would probably be of benefit to us. Super. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Moore. Thank you, Mayor. Ian, I just had a question. I know you weren't considering parking garages, but I just wondering if you could tell us what the situation is with the parking garage that's up Union Street that, by the old sheriff's building. Who's using that, and is that a possibility for expanded parking for city use? Yeah, so it's this is an old aerial, but I think you're yeah, it's built basically here. They've yeah. expanded it. Yeah. I, I I don't I haven't specifically talked to the county about what they expect. I know that this lot as well on Union, uh -huh. this is owned by the county. They traditionally what the county does is they um, reserve it for the use of their employees and their purposes during the week okay. when they're running court and they have other needs for employees. I know that uh, in my dealings with the First Baptist Church or Solid Rock Church, they were then uh, allowed by the county, just like if you came to a special event and it's after hours, mm -hmm. the public is will you can use that lot. Um, I think this lot will be handled in much the same way. I haven't, I haven't heard that officially from them, but I'm sure that that's the same way they're running it. I know that I've personally parked in there in off hours when they're not using it for employee purposes. So they're pretty good about opening their facilities when it's not needed for their employees during the work week. I had to see that as possible, maybe additional parking that could be available. Yeah, and, it, and it, it is. I mean, this deck, I think that, that parking lot has, uh, I think, like 60 spaces or something yeah. that are used by p visitors to town, at least in the off hours and, mm -hmm. and on the weekends. Saturdays. So there's, a, yeah. there's quite a bit of parking over here. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and a lot of the things that we're doing, obviously, um, if we have special events and we have things going on, the inventory of parking is overrun. We, we all know that. Every single space is taken, and then these issues go further back into the things, and every single parking stall is done. But it's good to keep relatively close, quick turnover spots near businesses so that people don't have to walk super far. Yeah. And this these stalls that we found... Um, I think we're not utilized, and it, so it's a really good change. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I, I support as many um, three-hour spaces as we can get, but we have to be mindful of a turnover for the bars and restaurants because, um, you know, that you do have those tourists that get a ticket, and I've seen them down in the basement of the courthouse paying their fine, and they're very vocal about it and saying, I'm never coming back here again. So we um, certainly want to encourage people to have a good experience, and getting a ticket is probably not a good experience to have after you come here and spend money eating, drinking, shopping, entertainment. And then my other comment is, um, do you have any um, thoughts about the, um, the new city hall parking uh, area, how that's going to work for uh, public? So I know that internally with staff, especially from the city manager's office, we've been working with um, Prescott College, who purchased the um, old APS facility mm -hmm. back behind the Hilton. Mm -hmm. To, uh, we've laid out parking on that property mm -hmm. in um, anticipation of an agreement between the city and them to allow us to utilize some of that parking that's not needed by the college mm -hmm. to house our what we call the white fleet. So as the city starts, more city employees start to move in there as the improvements are done, mm -hmm. um, we can't house all the fleet vehicles that we would need for the employees that need to be there. So in that sense, we've talked about it moving those vehicles over to a conveniently located place that we can do that and then um, employees that that frees up space for the public to come and handle their business at the building department or council meetings or otherwise um, beyond that i don't think we've talked specifically too much about other things but yeah it, it has been certainly a issue of conversation okay thank you 
I will say one more thing at the uh, public meeting with PDP and the chamber. Um, we did have uh, participation by some of our parking enforcement from PD. Um, Amy Bonney's people were there, and so he did. Uh, one of the, he's a parking enforcement officer that routinely, you know, is patrolling the downtown, and so he certainly had opportunity to review the map, and so that we could get the input of whether he thought those stalls, because he who who better knows whether people are violating and getting tickets. And so he really did concur with most of the locations that weren't being utilized, and he felt like that would be easy and less areas for him to have to patrol and even see if someone's violating. So I think from that standpoint, it likely, like, like the chief said, they'll enforce whatever is put out there. But if we can reduce the, the numbers and locations to areas where you know, lower areas, then that's a good thing. And so we did get that input too. So we not only got public, but police on that end supported it as well. I have uh, one question. Are, is there any danger of us bringing back the meter made with the chalk on the stick, <laughs> marking the tires? We, so we did not bring up that as a concept. So I'll leave that to uh, good. So I don't. So far, nobody's really wanted to do that. No, I think there was a uh, ruling man. that said uh, you can't chalk uh, tires anymore. Yeah, and they're, they're not chalking tires. They're using electronic. I think uh, readers. I think they read license plates. Right. So they they moved away from that. They have a way to uh, certainly know whether or not you've moved your car. <laughs> but meters is another thing. Well, that's happened sometimes when uh, maybe a tourist assumes that uh, they're okay until they see the chalk mark, and then they realize there's not going to be one, then they get the ticket and they go, I'm never going back. <laughs> yeah, so the, the final slide I had was just uh, following the final public input and the summary to you guys, any additional small minor modifications, then we anticipate that the conversion will take about a month um, with the 114 initially identified, we had 31 signposts to be removed, certain uh, signs to be removed, and then we have to place new signs and relocate things with arrows just to make all the zones go back together properly. So um, relatively quick implementation once we get all the input. And I think with that, if there was any additional questions. So I, I think uh, well, we're going to leave this open for public comment until... Uh, the 19th of August, mm -hmm. and then if there's no um, serious objections or some unknown uh, impact, then we'll go ahead and uh, order the signs and then have the conversion made. Yes, that's the plan. Do we have any public comment? Um, Not, Mayor. Sarah? No. All right, then. Um, geez, we're going to have um, 45 minutes until our uh, voting meeting oh, starts, boy. so... Oh, boy. Um, enjoy your uh, time off here in between Go out meetings. and move my car. This um, <laughs> study session is adjourned.